Right, just a very quick look inside this thing. This is an um, electronic transformer for running halogen lamps. This puts out um, 12 volts AC. And up, so this one's up to 100 watts, so it's 11.8. I've got a 40 watt load on here. Those, the electronic ones are used pretty much universally now. Instead of the old, this is an old toroidal lighting transformer. This one's um, 200 watts, so this is only twice the power of this. But it's um, being a traditional transformer, it's very heavy, which might be a problem if you've got to install it in a plasterboard ceiling or something. But also the price of copper, just the the fact that this is running at 60 hertz, it needs a big lump of um, iron for the core and quite a lot of copper to go out to reach around it to um, provide the output current capability. So these things are pretty expensive. Um, whereas these things are like about, about five quid or so, um, even for a brand name Philips ones, you can get no name Chinese ones even cheaper than that. Now you might think these are pretty similar to a switch mode power supply in that they take um, mains input and provide an isolated low voltage output, but there are quite a few significant differences. Because it's running lighting, um, it doesn't have to, do, to produce a nice smooth DC output. Um, the, the thermal mass of the filament means that um, a non-continuous AC signal is just as good and actually turns out quite a bit cheaper. The other thing on this is the actual voltage spec, where most switch modes of power supplies have got universal input, say 90 to 260 volts. This one specifies nominally 230 to 240 um, and the actual range 170 to 264. Um, again, this is ma ma mainly just to reduce cost, but the application is different. You know, fixed lighting is screwed to, yeah, is nailed to a wall, screwed into a ceiling. It's not going to need to be transported around the world. And also lighting, there's all sorts of different regulations and standards in different countries. So having to produce different products for different voltage ranges isn't really much of a big deal. Um, there's quite a few different approvals as well as standard products. The lighting industry has got quite a lot of other approvals to do with safety, temperature rise, various other things. The other issue is that um, these, these need to be dimmable. And this actually says on here um, leading and trailing edge dimming, and this refers to uh, triac type phase angle dimmers. Um, and obviously, the electronic conversion process has to give a reasonable dimming of the output as the input voltage is dimmed, so you can use standard dimmers. Well, if we look at the output waveform of this, it looks quite interesting. We've got these bursts, these are with the 100 Hz main frequency, indicating that there's no smoothing capacitance in there as you would have on a switch mode supply, which again, because it's lighting, it doesn't really matter. And the actual frequency is varying throughout the cycle um, significantly if we do a single, single trace there. We see the frequency is about 68 kilohertz, um, and it's basically a square wave. You can see the um, Depending where you're on the waveform, the, the voltage varies quite a lot. If you look over a single, full cycle, we see uh, our RMS voltage is about 11.6, which is about right. But the actual peak-to-peak -peak voltage is 37 volts. Just because of this square wave waveform, it's sort of quite a long way from a sine wave, so there's a big difference between the RMS and the peak-to-peak -peak voltages. But say so because we're just driving a filament, that doesn't really matter. It's just really about making the thing cheap, reasonably efficient. Uh, this is also why obviously you shouldn't use these transformers for drive LED lighting because the peak voltage uh, will almost certainly cause problems. This is the PCB inside. Um, you can see there's not a huge amount in here. This is the main output transformer. Again, unlike switch mode power supply, there's no feedback at all. The output transformer winding goes directly to the output terminals. The only other connection is this little capacitor that connects the output to the uh, the main side. This is for RF suppression. Um, it's using the main side as effectively a, a ground reference. The capacitor value is low enough that you're not going to get any hazardous voltage on here. But, but without that, the capacitance across the core can mean that this 68 kilohertz um, produces quite a large common mode voltage swing. So all this external wiring acts an antenna. You also very often see this in switch mode power supplies as well particularly ones that uh, don't have an earth connection. Um, they use the, yeah, effectively the, the live and neutral in our, effect, as far as RF is concerned, as close to ground as, as doesn't matter. Um, this, there's like a, a potted inner bobbin with the primary, that's actually where the mains is, so you've got this solid plastic insulation and then there's just this um, double layer of um, secondary winding to produce a fairly thick, so this is a 100 watt transformer, so that's putting out about 8 amps. The actual circuitry is extremely simple. Basically, there's these two NPN transistors. Um, there's one other transistor here and a few diodes, and that's it. There's no chips, no nothing. It's an extremely simple bit of circuitry. I'll just follow the uh, the path through. We've got the mains input here. Obviously, we've got, we've got a terminal block here with a missing centerpiece to ensure clearance. And there's something a bit strange. There's this wire. This is actually a bit of ordinary wire that's also got some heat shrink sleeving across it. Now, this clearly isn't a bodge because it is actually marked on the PCB. Now, 
this is actually just connecting from here to here. Um, I can only assume this is to get adequate clearance, but there's an awful, you know, there's still an awful lot of clearance distance here. It could be that the um, there may be some standards in lighting that require a higher clearance di safety clearance distance than um, normal products, but I find it hard to believe that there actually wasn't enough clearance on the PCB to get from here to here without leaving sufficient clearance. Um, the clearances that you need on mains, is, most of the clearance is not so much between the live and neutral, so here we've only got maybe about four millimetres. It's really a, it's, it's to do with safety, so it's firstly between the primary and the secondary side, but also across uh, fuses. Here, this is actually a 0.22 ohm a fusible resistor. Um, you can tell that the, the body material is like a sort of rough ceramic type material and the idea of that is if, if it does sort of burn out you don't actually get any flames. They're sometimes called flame proof, proof resistors. So this is acting both as a fuse but also to limit um, any peak surge current and say so that you've got this big clearance across it because the fuse being a safety component you can't have the fuse, fuse blow and then have it arc across. But so I'm rather surprised about this this wire here because the rest of it, the build quality looks you know, pretty decent. Um, there's a capacitor across the line, this again is noise filtering, and this fairly large inductor, this is in series of the mains. There's also a, an MOV, Varista, for voltage surge suppression here, so there's quite a lot of suppression on there. And again, lighting products have fairly strict standards as to how much interference they can kick down, down, down the line. Um, this inductor may also be part of the um, compatibility with dimmers, because triac based dimmers need a certain amount of minimum loading, otherwise they go a bit unstable. Um, then it goes through a bridge rectifier to produce DC. There's another Verista here for more um, over voltage protection. Um, and the rest is just um, a fairly simple oscillator circuit. circuit. There's um, a few sort of fairly big capacitors here. Those are 47 nanofarad. So that's probably going to be setting up a resonant circuit with the, the primary on here. Um, so circuitry wise it's, yeah, it's extremely simple. It doesn't have to work over a huge wide range. The accuracy doesn't need to be super good. So um, quite quite a sort of, quite a lot of value engineering going going into this thing. There's a few safety mount parts on the bottom. One thing um, to notice is the all the resistors and the small parts are all 1206. Now you don't really see 1206s very often these days because 0805s are generally the standard sort of biggest component, and then 0603s are almost as common. But I think the reason is that this board looks like it's been flow soldered um, because on something like this you've always got big chunky terminal blocks, um, transformers, and uh, big tr chunky transistors, it's never going to be fully surface mount. So in order to minimise the production cost, what they've done is it's basically a flow soldering process where the board passes over a wave of molten solder. And they're also wave soldering the surface mount parts. Um, you can see the actual pads are quite big compared to the sort of pad size you'd see on a standard surface mount board. Um, they're also glued down, so what they do is they do the pick and place operation, probably with no solder paste at all. Um, but a little bit before that they, they put glue dots down either via a dot dispenser or a silk screen process. So they place all the components, then then do all the through hole parts and then, then flow the whole thing um, in one go. So I think that's the reason they've used 1206 is just to maximise the, the clearance across the part because with a 1206 the aspect ratio is quite a lot uh, bigger than say an 805 and the length compared to the width is quite a lot more. So you've got these sort of fairly decent sized blobs of solder on each end but without the risk of them bridging across. And that's all pretty much it. Not really much more to say. There's a little sort of another coil here. I'm guessing this is maybe a blocking oscillator or something simple. Yes, it is a very simple um, inductor based oscillator. Very low cost, very low cost components. So not even a chip in there. Obviously they produce these by the gazillion, so they're sort of very high volume, so they've obviously spent a lot of time optimising the circuit to uh, minimise the build costs whilst maintaining the uh, performance they need. Well, I thought I'd try having a little bit of fun with this thing. Um, as this produces a nice fairly high power, high frequency uh, signal, it's quite good for driving things like this. This is a flyback transformer for an old monitor. What I've done is I've connected one lamp directly across the output to give it a constant load to keep it happy um, and a second one in series with the coil. I've wound this a few turns around the outer limb of this transformer, although there the generally are some available windings on, on there, it's a case of finding them and if you get it wrong you can zap some voltage back to the um, transformer. And I actually want to keep this thing working because it's got to go into something. 
Um, so just to be on the safe side, I've done an external winding, put this current limiting in. In practice, you know, by carefully controlled abuse, you could probably get quite a lot more power out of it than I'm doing here. But uh, even with this simple setup, you can get about uh, three quarter inch spark off of the uh, transformer. Now this high voltage isn't particularly dangerous, it will certainly hurt if you touch it, but also um, because it's all, uh, this high frequency arc does produce quite a lot of heat, so probably the, the most pain will be from a burn rather than any electrical shock type thing.